At this point, I admit my defeat. No poet, comic or tragic, ever was more outdone by his theme than I am now, for, as sunlight does to the weakest eyes, so did the mere thought of her lovely smile strike every recognition from my mind. From the first day that I beheld her face in this life till the vision of her now, I could trust in my poems to sing her praise. But now I must stop trying to pursue her beauty in my verse, for I have done as much as any artist at his best. Hello and welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time around, we'll be talking about Dante's Paradiso. I know I have a feeling of having come full circle, as it were, um, in that we're now reading the third part of the Divine Comedy. And so we've been reading it over a long period, like in a cyclical kind of way. Is this the longest it's ever taken you to read the comedy? I guess, right? Because it's all been stretched out. (laughs) I guess so. Yeah, I I certainly haven't done it in this way before. Yeah, because we read the Inferno very early on. I think it was, I checked earlier, I think it was our seventh uh, text that we read, something like that. Yeah, I think we've been doing, have we done one a year or did we skip a year? Eh, it doesn't matter. Something like, and then we did uh, Purgatorio sort of in between, and now we're finishing up. Will we read more Dante? This is the question. Will we read more Dante? You know, we haven't done the books that I... <laughs> I mean, I don't think we'll ever read De Vulgari Eloquentia for this podcast, but it is my favorite Dante. It is very good. You never know. You never know. So before we begin, we should also mention, of course, what translations we looked at. I've got Mark Muses, which was published by Penguin, uh, in my Portable Dante, which has all sorts of stuff in it. It's very nice. We've looked at Musa before, and I, I think it's a very readable translation and seemingly very accurate. It is a good one. I've got actually Charles Singleton's translation, which I, I really love them just because they're they're facing page, they're prose, and so it's super easy to kind of go back and forth between the Italian and the English. And um, also have a sentimental attachment to them because when I was an undergraduate, like a hundred years ago, uh, the very, very aged Singleton was still teaching Dante. And so I had a chance to sit in his class. And so my copy of the Inferno has notes from that time. So I all sentimental about it. <laughs> that is very sweet. Yeah, it was a bit of a curmudgeon, but it is kind of sweet. <laughs> Sometimes that's nice in a professor. I don't know. I've also got the Marcus Sanders translation with the illustrations by Sandow Burke, which we've mentioned in previous Dante episodes. I finally broke down and bought a copy of it. It's very fun. I took a peek at the translation, though I only just got it a few days ago and didn't really have a chance to like read both of them at the same time. It seems very translated into... It's a very modern idiom, but it still seems fairly faithful to the text, so to speak. Uh, the illustrations are, of course, wild, mm-hmm. but we'll talk about them perhaps a bit later. Well, for people who've somehow missed our first two Dante episodes, we should probably give them a little reminder of exactly who Dante was and when and why he wrote the Divine Comedy. Yeah, I think we can probably keep it pretty short, but just to orient people. So Dante lived at the end of the 13th and beginning of the 14th century, born in 1265, died in 1321. He was a poet. He was involved in politics and he was an exile. He was exiled from the city of Florence, uh, where he lived the early part of his life in 1301, 1302. And um, he never returned to the city. And the bitterness of that fact of exile really is reflected in the poetry in all kinds of ways. He wrote the Divine Comedy, which is the work that makes him most famous, but he also wrote a number of other things. Uh, we already mentioned briefly the De Vulgari Eloquentia, which is a text in Latin about how great Italian is. We, we may read that sometime, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. Uh, the Vita Nova, a very beautiful early book of um, uh, short poems that he writes commentary on, and I also am really fond of that work. We may, may come back to it at some point. The Convivio and the Monarchia, which is more of a kind of a political tract. Mostly he talks about how much he hates Florence, but he also (laughs) talks about other things like the nature of the universe, salvation, uh, language, poetry, and the divine. So he's he's kind of an, I guess you could say, an encyclopedic writer as well in some ways. Now, when you say how much he hates Florence. Hates and loves. (laughs) Well, it's specifically like what's happened to Florence, right? Like Mm. Florence is this city that should be fabulous and he's got lots of great memories of it but also there's all these evils happening there and the terrible people who kicked him out and the terrible politics both within the city and within the church just just oh oh they're driving him mad yeah 
I mean, that's one of the things I think that's I find really fascinating about Dante. And it doesn't come out everywhere in the Divine Comedy, but it comes out at moments. This with this wellspring of passion, right? It's often, often I think, anger. There's like all this sense of incredibly repressed emotion at a lot of points in the text. And I think that's one of the reasons that it continues to speak to people. Um, also, the beauty of the language. I mean, whether you like or don't like the particular vision of the cosmos and uh, political and social and moral vision that Dante espouses, and the language is lovely. I don't think I've seen anybody disagree with that too much. It's so lyrical, so poetic, so balanced. I mean, I don't mean to all fan girl out about it, but it's really beautiful language. Although, you know, Paradiso is, so much of it is about how much he can't say. What's inexpressible. It's inexpressible. It's indescribable with mere words. Even, a, even the best artist wouldn't be able to describe this. And it's fascinating that he keeps returning to that particular trope. Which was, you know, a common enough trope sometimes, and still is, I suppose. It's, you know, I can't even put in words how how amazing this is. But he returns to it again and again. We'll talk about that in a bit. But it's interesting to think about like the nature of his lyricism and and his writing, while also dealing with the fact that he is describing, he is failing to describe things. Like his language is breaking down constantly in the Paradiso. Exactly. There, there's going to be a whole bunch of examples of that that we might talk about, but I'm going to just give us just one right now that I think captures that quality of like language falling apart, but also language being incredibly powerful um, and, and almost seductive. It's this moment in Canto 30, so pretty close to the end, where he says this, No infant on waking far after its hour so suddenly rushes with face toward the milk as then did I to make yet better mirrors of my eyes, stooping to the wave which flows there, that we may be bettered in it. And even as the eaves of my eyelids drank of it, so it seemed to me out of its length to have become round. And he has this vision that goes on. And you read it, and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but but that figure of the infant is what anchors it. And the infant, like the word literally means, you know, um, in fonts, like in- incapable of speech, not yet able to speak, right? And this idea of um, being an infant, being unable to have the power of speech, but rushing toward the milk, which is at once light right, that you see with the mirrors of your eyes and is also a wave that inundates you and you bathe in and your eyes drink of the water, which is also light. You know, so it's it's oddly, I don't know, hallucinogenic, I guess, kind of. And language is just barely hanging on to it. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see what happens. Let me let me so tell you what plot. happens. Yes, the, this. Plot. the plot. Yes, I know you're all in tenterhooks <laughs> waiting to find out what happens next. Poor Dante. Well, when last we left our hero, Dante had gone down, down, down into the depths of hell, and then up, up, up the mountain of purgatory, meeting all sorts of illustrious personages along the way who would explain to him what's going on. And now on the final leg, Dante, now being guided by his beloved Beatrice, will ascend into heaven. And much as hell had its nine rings and purgatory had its seven terraces, heaven has nine nested spheres. And so as you go out, you reach the moon, then Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the fixed stars, so the stars, basically. And then what's called the prima mobile, which is a sort of outer sphere whose movements control the movements of all the spheres within. And then outside of that is the Empyrean, where God is, along with a great number of souls, which together form the shape of a rose. Now, heaven is overwhelming to Dante's mortal senses. Everything, as we said, is indescribably beautiful. But Beatrice is there to help him understand what's going on and to facilitate his conversations with the illustrious spirits that he encounters. Now, of course, in hell, the spirits he met were suffering, each of them having a very unique punishment that fitted their type of sin. And then in purgatory, the spirits he met were struggling to overcome their moral deficiencies. Here, though, everyone is just radiating in God's glories. If occasionally complaining about the terrible state of morality back on earth, especially within the church and especially in Florence. Near the end of his journey, Dante gets quizzed by St. Peter, St. James, and St. John on the nature of faith, hope, and love. And Dante easily shows how much his theological understanding has grown through his journey. And so when they reach beyond the nine spheres to the Empyrean, Beatrice quietly leaves Dante's side, taking her position with all the other souls in the rose. And St. Bernard 
is Dante's guide through the very final section, as Dante regards Mary and then directly encounters God, who appears as three circles of the same size taking up the same space. And as he attempts to describe this final direct encounter with God, Dante's language fails him one last time, and the poem ends. It's a big end. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. As you're describing the plot, you know, I keep thinking about what it's like to read. And, and you know, my sense of reading the Paradiso, and I'm curious to hear if this is similar to your experience or not, is that it's like walking through pudding or something like that. Like it's, like, it's, like, it's like it's just so much and so all-encompassing that it's hard to know where you are and to be oriented, um, I find. And then you, you find moments where you identify the transitions where you're moving from one sphere to the other. And there'll be episodes of conversations or particular um, vivid visual images and so on. But the structure is is so much, so different from what we found in the first two parts in the Inferno and the Purgatorio. And similar to the Inferno and different from the Purgatorio in terms of what the people there are capable of. Like you just said a couple moments ago that the people there are radiating in God's glory. It's like they're static, right? They, they've, they're they where they need to be, right? They're at the appropriate level in the heavenly spheres. In the same way that those who were in hell were at the appropriate level in, you know, in, in the underworld. In purgatorial, by contrast, people were moving, right? There was this kind of sense of dynamism, right? And they were moving both through their own will and through what grace allowed them to do. So there's this kind of two-way motion of them being empowered and them willing to go. Um, and that that's completely absent here in the same way it was absent in the Inferno. And so I, I find that really interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. You said, you said a lot there. Um, let's see. First off, yes, I absolutely agree that there is something putting <laughs> like, <laughs> in fact, sometimes it feels like you're just swallowing the same spoonful of pudding. I think the metaphor is getting mixed up here, but because there is such a similar texture throughout all of Paradiso. And I think you're absolutely right to point to the transitions as they move from one sphere to another as an interesting moment to think about and and how that reflects this. Because uh, back in the Inferno, there were all sorts of different ways that you would get from one level of hell to another. Some of them quite dramatic, right? Big demons or whatever coming down and carrying them across. And same thing in Purgatorio. It was a little less dramatic, but you still had distinct ways of getting from one terrace of of the mountain to the next. Here, every single time, it's just floating up to the next level, to the point where Dante doesn't even realize it's happening until it's basically done. Yeah, it's often retrospective. Yeah. Yeah, it's catching him by surprise. It's sort of slipped in. Like, I feel like Dante is trying to obscure... I mean, they're all there, but he's trying to obscure this by by just sort of having them happen in the as much in the background as a linear narrative can have it be. I've been I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I wonder if part of what's going on there is again that distinction that he's drawing between what movement in Paradiso is like and what movement in the Purgatorio is like. So in the Purgatorio, like I said, it's kind of a combination, right? Um, grace makes it possible for you to move, and then your will is required to move on, right? Because these souls are kind of expiating their 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 stain of sin, right? In the uh, Paradiso, though, there's there's the static quality of those who are in the spheres of the heavens. And Dante himself also is not moving through his own will so much as he's being lifted up, like he's he's being drawn up, right? And I think that's why you get that weird kind of almost invisible passing from one domain to the next. And then he like looks back, like there's this one moment that happens Um, after he's come through the seventh sphere, he's just past the sphere of Saturn and he's looking back down on the seven spheres of the planets, right? And he, he looks down and saw this globe such that I smiled at its paltry semblance. You know, there's this look back kind of down, uh, uh, down below. And so that sort of looking back kind of thing, which he doesn't do very often, but that sense that like you're being carried forward rather than moving yourself. I think that's kind of, uh, what's being created here. In addition to that, as you say, there's also this notion that the spirits aren't trying to move anywhere. Even the people who are at the quote-unquote lesser rings are perfectly content with their lot, because as they explain, no matter where you are, you will receive as much radiant love God stuff as your spirit can handle. And it's kind of the same if you're very close up or very far away. It's like, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. You're going to eat as much as you need to. You're not going to be hungry. No more, no less. And 
And and that's remarkable, right? There's there's no there's no real difference in a certain sense between one sphere and the next in terms of I mean, I guess vaguely slightly more holy things go further up, but not really. Like people are just a, they're just categorized. Yeah. It's 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 actually it's really trippy because there's a moment early in the Paradiso where she like explains to Dante how this all works. How they was thinking is like Beatrice's science experiment. <laughs> and it's kind of mystifying when you just read it Tanto too, but then once you've read the whole thing, you like kinda of look back at it, and you're like, Oh, that's what that was about. So she's what she's doing ostensibly is explaining to him why the moon looks the way it does, where it looks like it has darker and lighter parts. And so she's explaining it as this kind of optical phenomenon. But she, she uses a kind of a, a thought experiment, right? She says, you, you, could, you could use experiment, she says, to sort this out. Uh, she says, from this objection experiment, which is the fountain to the streams of your arts, may do, deliver you if you ever try it. She says, take three mirrors and set two of them equally remote from you and let the other, even more remote, meet your eyes between the first two. Turning toward them, cause a light to be placed behind your back, which may shine in the three mirrors and return to you reflected from all three. Although the more distant image may not reach you so great in quantity, you will see it must needs be of equal brightness with the others. Now, this is kind of confusing, right? But um, I've thought about this for a long time, so I think I understand how it works. So she's saying basically the three mirrors are in different places, but they all reflect back the same amount of light. And that might be kind of hard to notice if you just have like, I don't know, a candle flame or something. You've got these three regular sized mirrors because the amount of space each one takes up on the mirror is going to be different. But if you imagine a big light source, like a blazing fire or something, and mirrors that are a smaller size so that the whole surface is illuminated, you'll see that if they're close by or far away, the mirrors all reflect the same amount of light. And that's the science experiment that explains the physics of heaven. And that's why it's just as good to be way up in the Empyrean as to be in like circle two or three. This is not the first time Dante has done a sort of, you can do it yourself at home. Try this now, kids. Experiment. He, lo- he loves to do that. <laughs> and I do kind of like those, although this one is a little bit too abstract for me to figure out how I would do it myself. Oh my God, it took me forever. I took me forever to work that out. Okay. So like, but, but I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that's what he's saying there. I'm pretty sure that's the physics that he's kind of anchoring this vision of the the heavens in yeah yeah and of course there's quite a lot of the physics of heaven throughout Mm -hmm, this book mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so, you know we asked the question like what's it like to read this book well you're going to encounter a lot of things that the poet cannot describe you're going to encounter a lot of theology that you may or may not be excited about and also an attempt to explain the physics of heaven as dante understands it i should say theology through dante's idiosyncratic lens and then you're going to find out sort of local history, history of Rome, history of Florence, and a lot of people who are in heaven suddenly stopping their radiance to get real angry about what's going on mm-hmm. down on earth. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and that's 90% of this book. No, yeah, it's going to be like a kind of a local history he's preoccupied with, but quite a personal history in some places, like when he runs into his ancestor, Caccia Guida, right? Um, that's a really interesting and important section that goes over a few contos. Um, but there's also like moments of abstraction too, right? Like these kind of vivid abstract images that show up every now and then um, in the different circles, like rainbows or rings or an eagle or a ladder or a river or the rose that you mentioned earlier. And they're doing a certain kind of like, I would say kind of opposite kind of work, right? There's the intensely local that's happening when he's talking about Florence or even his own personal position right, in the world. But there's also this movement toward the abstract. And it's interesting to think about how they're in tension with one another. Yeah, I found the cantos with Ketchiguita really interesting and weird. As you say, there are a lot of them. And if I'm remembering correctly, it's basically the exact middle of this, uh, of, of Paradiso. It's, it's a little it earlier. In... It's like 14 through 18 thereabouts, I think. Well, yeah, exactly. So, so the midsection of the book is between 16 and 17, right? So. I guess that's true. I guess that's true. And it is also in the middle in terms of like the spheres. It's the sphere of Mars, which is the fifth one, right? So exactly. We're... Exactly. So so there's a really like a central thing about this conversation. And it's him meeting his great, great grandfather. And he just gives a big, long history of, of Florence and Dante's ancestors in Florence, what old Florence used to be like, and how crappy Florence has become. There's a massive list of all the different like noble families of Florence, which I'm sure you enjoyed. I certainly did. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know who any of these people were, but it was a nice list. It seemed like it was very important to Dante anyways. Um, 
And then he asks about the future as well, in, starting in Canto 17. So, you know, what is my life going to be? And Kachiguita tells him about the exile he's about to encounter, but also how freaking great this poem is he's going to write. <laughs> he's his hype man. I mean, ah, oh, Dante. Oh, my God. <laughs> You've clearly forgotten, you know, Limbo in Inferno, where he's hanging out with, like, you know, Aristotle and Plato and Homer and those guys. And they're like, hey, come join us. And he's like, and so I was one of their number. Yeah, no, I, I did not forget about that. Doctor would never <laughs> let me forget about such a thing. He's very convinced of his importance. Well, it's a neat, it's, it's a neat section in so many different ways. One of the ways it's kind of neat is the father-son relationship, you know, I mean, you know, quasi-father-son relationship that he's setting up with himself and Katja Guida, his ancestor. Like you said, he's his great-great-grandfather, but there's this really interesting father-son language that gets used. Right when we're first uh, about to see Katja Guida, this is in uh, Canto 15, Dante says, with like affection did the shaded Anchises stretch forward when in Elysium he perceived his son. Right? So he's setting himself here, uh, of course, as um, Aeneas, right? And that's an analogy that had been happening all the way back in the beginning of the Inferno. But here it's in the context of the father-son relationship, right? And um, uh, a little later on, there's this um, Cacha Guida speaking to Dante. He uses this really interesting metaphor, this organic or sort of vegetable metaphor. He says to him, oh, my branch in whom I took delight only expecting you, I was your root. Um, it's this idea of like this organic thing, you know, there's the root and the branch and the frond, right? And this father-son thing. Like, it's kind of poetic and, you know, nice, but it's also like, I don't know, I find it a little weird. I can't put my finger on exactly what it is I find weird about it. Well, one of the things that's interesting about that metaphor, that, you know, very familiar metaphor of the family tree, right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that one of the points of this is that it's a, it's a depiction of a a type of history or a type of passage of time as generations pass on to generations. And Dante never actually met Cacciaguida, right? His great, great grandfather, unless, unless the dates are much more, uh, I don't, I don't know if that so. math works uh, out, but let's so, say yeah. no, let's say no. <laughs> um, and yet here we have the branch and the root in the same place talking to each other. So there's a sense of like the strangeness of the time that can happen here, that uh, we're experiencing a very specific time and a very abstract time, a very long time that's being wrapped up in this in this moment. That's a really neat point because that happens kind of in a historical sense too, just a, a little bit later on, still in the Cachagrita section, and we're like so this is like Canto eighteen when uh, we start hearing about the other people who are there in that sphere with Cachaguita. So this is the sphere of Mars where it's got warriors, right? People who have been notable in warfare. And so uh, Dante is seeing all the other people that are there. There's um, Maccabees, Charlemagne and Roland, uh, William of Orange, Godfrey of Bologna, uh, Robert Giscard, you know, crusaders and people like that, right, from all different periods. So there's this kind of sense that like you were saying, that different times, different historical times are collapsed into the one time um, of this afterworld. Yeah, although it hit a bit differently when it is like a person talking to their ancestor yeah. of long enough ago that they wouldn't have met them, but not so long ago that they would have been erased from their, potentially, their sense of their family past. I mean, mm -hmm. gosh, I don't think I know what my great-great-grandfather's name was, but... <laughs> Any of them. But I bet Dante would have. I bet Dante heard that story. Like, he was just a, a, in a different culture where that would have mattered in a different way. And, but again, that, that, that crusade thing. I mean, Cacciagrid is somebody who's associated with crusade, right? And so this is a, a way that Dante, through his family lineage, participates in that history of holy war, right? Yeah. And then having... Cacciaguida then sort of tell the history of Florence from his perspective, right? Um, which not only lends the story a bit more veracity because it's allegedly coming from the great grandfather, but also it really ties in with this sense of like the family as a history unto itself. Like your, your family's memories and traditions are themselves this kind of history. I don't know, it just manifests in, in a really interesting way. And I, it, 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 in a certain sense, it seems kind of obvious. You meet the spirit of your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather, they tell you all about what things used to be like where you live and what things are now. But, but in this book, which is so much about very specific like contingent time, things that are specifically happening to Dante, where everything is, you know, we know the day, that Dante is supposed to have begun 
not not begun writing the poem, but begun the poem. Mm-hmm. Like the journey, as it were. Yeah, yeah. it starts off in the, he's in the Lost Woods and it's a particular day. And he will he will finish the journey and return to Earth on a particular day. And this, you know, lays out what day he arrives and what time he arrives in Paradiso. So, so he's wrestling with like the specifics of it, but he's also uh, like, like, uh, like Augustine was, he's trying to understand what it's like to live outside of time, what it's like to be in, in an eternity, which is sort of what Paradiso feels like, right? It's pudding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what I was reflecting on that too. It's neat that you said that because I was thinking about some of the other things we've been reading, you know, um, Sabald's Rings of Saturn, Augustine's Confessions. And Sabald's work, we said, also had a kind of weird plotlessness you know we were just sort of moving but we didn't seem to be moving within the confines of a plot but augustine is i think an even better comparison or even more interesting comparison because we did have a really strong sense of moving through time in the first nine books the confessions where like augustine was giving us the account of his life right he was giving us his confession in some way right um and it was real clear like how old he was here how old he was there how old he was there and then after book nine we move into those last few books and it's like pudding (laughs) <laughs> was it not? Yeah. You know, and so Dante is almost like giving us both of those. Like we've got the sense of a linear narrative, but it's embedded within or refracted through this other mar- narrative form, right? The pudding narrative form. Yeah. And I think it serves to make me rethink about the Zabald, about how it was achieving some of this weird relationship with time, but without the concept of eternity, right? It wasn't it wasn't playing off the the thing that is always going to be firm and eternal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was none of that. Everything is mushy, but there's connections between everything and you can ride those connections. You can go down that rabbit hole endlessly, right? Yeah, things survive over time, like as kind of fragments or relics. Remember the things that are in the urn, the little scrap of silk or whatever for Zabald, right? It's a very different notion of where stability, such as it, as it is, might be found. Yeah, so I don't know. That's why I was thinking that that the Caccia Guida section really just strikes me in the center of Paradiso. This like it really you really feel the tensions of the, the past, present, and future, and the eternal all all messing with each other and relating to this very this very familial you know home like thing. Yeah, a very intimate relation. The other really intimate relationship presumably in here is with Beatrice, right? You mentioned a little bit earlier. And we were saying before, like in Canto to that sort of science experiment moment, like she's sort of, she's very didactic, like she's a teacher in that mode almost, right? And there are a number of passages where she gets explicitly likened to like a mom who yells at you, basically. <laughs> so like she's she's kind of like, you know, if we're accustomed to thinking about her as the, you know, the beloved, you know, this, this person that Dante fell in love with very early on and was absolutely compelled by finding again, you know, uh, as he moves in through the earthly paradise, you know, like here she's a bit different, you know, and it's interesting to think about what is that relationship? What, what is she being for him here? Is she standing in for other things? Like what is she supposed to be? Well, the first time that she sees him in the end of uh, Purgatorio, mm-hmm. she yells at him, right? <laughs> well, yeah. A, that's her first move. Some men like that. <laughs> Some men do like that, and Dante may well have been one of them. Um, much of the book is Dante staring at Beatrice's face and seeing the radiance reflected in her, and then eventually learning to not need her as an intercessor and look directly, eventually at the end, directly at the face of God or face is perhaps the wrong term, but the three circles in one space of God. Well, she's a mediator, right? And there's there's a really neat way we get a sense of, again, the physics of how that works. And that's one of the things I find really interesting here, the physics of how that works. So at the beginning of Canto 21, uh, he, he's looking at her, you know, and she's serving that kind of mediating functions, right? So he says, already my eyes were fixed again on the face of my lady and with them my mind and from every other intent it was withdrawn. But And she did not smile, but said, Were I to smile, you would become such as with Samali when she was turned to ashes. For my beauty, which is kindled the more, as you have seen, the higher the ascent, were it not tempered, is so resplendent that your mortal powers at its flash would be like the bow shattered by a thunderbolt. She says, fix your mind after your eyes and make of them mirrors to the figure which in this mirror shall be shown to you. So again, there's this kind of optical physics going on here. But in particular, she's saying, you know, if you looked at, if I smiled when you looked at me, you know, poof, you'd be an incinerate. And it's kind of absurd, right? And you, you, when you first read it, you're like, oh, she's so beautiful that he'll be incinerated. Like, it doesn't make sense. But when you think about her as a um, mediator of the divine light, right? The, the thing, like the mirrors that are in the science experiment in Kanto too, right? Um, 
she's saying that, you know, you're not ready for that, right? That level of intense sort of reproduction and reflection. But just a couple of contos later, she's going to say something else. She says this, even as fire breaks from a cloud, so my mind becoming greater amid these feasts issued from itself and of what it became has no remembrance. And Beatrice says, open your eyes and look on what I am. You have seen things such that you have become able to sustain my smile. Right. So like just in a couple of contexts, right, he's made the transition and it's not that she's changed. He's changed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she's like instrumental in this weird kind of way. Right. So she's somebody he knows, right. In the same, in a very personal way, um, different from Cachavillo, but personal in the same kind of way, like part of his personal history. Like if we're talking about Augustine, this would be part of life in Carthage or life in Rome or Milan or something. Right. But she's also like just an instrument. Like she's the thing through which he gets somewhere else. She does have seemingly very little agency throughout the whole thing. I mean, it's not even her idea no. to save Dante. No. St. Lucy is like, hey, your friend over there seems to be in trouble. You should well, it's go. Not, go. It's not even St. Lucy, right? Like if you remember way back when in the beginning of the, um, I guess it's when Beatrice and you first meet, she explains it, or does it get explained in the Inferno? I can't remember when the explanation happens, but basically a lady came, I think this is in the Inferno, and came to Lucy, and then Lucy came to Beatrice, and Beatrice comes down. So it's like a kind of, I don't know what to call it, <laughs> relay race kind of thing. So it's Mary, actually, who sends Lucy, who sends Beatrice. Right. And he climbs back up the same ladder, you know what I'm saying? Like he goes back the same way, right? Yeah. Through the light, right? Which is Lucia, right? The play on Luce and Lucia, right? Of course, of course, right. Right? So that's why it's Beatrice and then the light and then Mary, right? Yeah. Hmm. It, uh... Yeah, I know. It all makes sense. <laughs> well, yeah now, yeah, now it all makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to think beyond that other than, you know, she is, she's confident and she knows how to, she knows how to keep Dante in check at least. Yeah. She does that. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's fascinating, right? So there's like these symmetrical structures, like we were saying with like, you know, the, the women who send for Dante's salvation and then the way in which he climbs back up, you know, through the parad- um, the steps in the Paradiso, right? Um, and you get this like almost like a mathematical symmetries in so many different moments of that text, right? There's, uh, God, there's like a whole lot of them. Um, there's one that I really like that happens at Canto 14, which um, for the Chaucer fans in the audience um, shows up again at the end of um, Chaucer's Troilus and Crusade. He says that one and two and three, whichever lives and ever reigns in three and two and one uncircumscribed and circumscribing all things was thrice sung by each of those spirits with a beautiful melody. You know, this, this like very mathiness, right? And there's this orderly structure, right? In the, the pudding that is the Paradiso. But there's also almost like, if I can continue the metaphor, these plums in the pudding, these vivid images that show up from time to time. And, and I find them really interesting. I've been reflecting on why is it I find them so interesting. I think it's because they don't have a kind of, I don't know, stepping stone or clearly sequential order like there's rainbows there's these rings there's the eagle that shows up um in um uh canto 18 there's a golden ladder at canto 21 there's light in the form of a river at canto 30 um, there's the celestial rose that we mentioned earlier in 31 but they're not i don't know what to call it. they're not they're like stepping stones in a river they're not like linear they're not how can I put, they don't have a, a clear order or sequence and i find that really fascinating because it means they're there functioning somehow somewhat differently. And I find that really neat. Hmm. I I have to admit, I think part of the reason why they stand out so much is that, uh, is that again, they're plums and pudding. Like there's so much pudding and then you find a plum <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm going to hold on to this image. I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, wow. It's something that is describable by the poet. It's something that I can actually think about. And it's something that's a little bit different than, oh, here comes another saint. And they're going to tell me a little bit more about how heaven works or what faith is or whatever. Or there's dancing and swirling and light and so on, right? Yeah. That That is the other thing. You, you, you mentioned a few times that the uh, the spirits here are all fixed, and they are, but they're also all whirling. They're all moving. Yeah, always. Spinning round and round in an activity that feels borrowed from another religious tradition entirely. Yeah, I know. It's so cool, right? Because for a couple of different reasons, right? So first of all, they're moving, but they're not moving the way that the folks in the purgatory are moving, right? Because they're making progress. They're moving up, right? Right. 
they're moving in a way that is kind of like the movement that you have in the inferno. Like, for example, uh, with the circle of the um, sodomites, right? Remember, we met Brunetto Latini in the inferno, and he's, you know, one of people's all running because there's this raining fire, and they all have to keep running in this circle, like basically around a kind of a track, right? Um, this is positive and beautiful as opposed to horrible and sad, right? But it's it's this idea of movement that does not take you from one place to another place, and that you know, so that kind of circling, um, but it's also transcendent, right? Yeah, well, we've read some books that come out of Sufi traditions of whirling and so forth as a form of devotion, or or like Atar's Conference of the Birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think it also came up in um, High. Yeah, High and Yaktan, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's just unusual to see it here, I guess. Um, yeah, but it's kind of cool, though, right? Because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really cool. It's just, well, too, it's, for two reasons, right? it's kind of, kind of coming out of a Neoplatonic idea of how geometry serves transcendent experience of the divine, you know, and that is part of the um, genealogy of Sufi thought. And it, so it makes so much sense when Sando Burke, who we mentioned earlier, did these wonderful illustrations of the um, uh, of the divine comedy. He says this neat thing about making the paradiso like how, how he did the illustrations for the paradiso and trying to convey it and he says um he says this as we move through our paradiso there begin to be more and more images from other religions imagining a more inclusive heaven from ancient aztecs to hindu goddesses and finally to the center of heaven mecca and the kaaba a place in this world our world that actually fits the description of dante's poem and so the mecca and kaaba references there is like is one of the frameworks we might call to mind we think about motion that is not so much about getting from one place to another as it is being in a certain kind of relation to a holy space. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say that that image is one of the ones that jumped out at me the most. It is uh, a sort of uh, camera way far back. We've got uh, the Dante and Beatrice stand-ins sort of on top of a minaret and looking at the people going around and around and around the Kaaba. And it is specifically... Uh, tied through the caption to the rose of heaven with the line standing there in paradise. I let my eyes wander over that stadium of souls from row to row up to the highest seats and back down to the lowest, trying to drink it all in. Mm, Nice to drink it all in. That's lovely. So I guess I want to do a little summing up. Like we've now read through the entire divine comedy. Um, Final thoughts. (laughs) You know, I, I I guess one of the things I'm thinking about is something that we talk about occasionally when we read a book uh, that one or both of us has read a number of times, and especially read at different times in our lives. And I still think Dante is just a beautiful writer, just an astonishingly beautiful writer. But I find myself less and less comfortable with, I don't know what to call it, the subject position. You know, like early on when I first read Dante, I was very much caught in the like sort of romance of Dante, the poet of exile and, you know, the whole love and dejection and despair. And, you know, and I found it all very romantic in a way, you know, I really was captivated. And now I read it and I'm like, this is a terrible political vision. (laughs) This is incredibly, (laughs) this is, this is morally incredibly disturbing <laughs> and and in ways that i'm only beginning to kind of really unpick like i've been thinking about things like sovereignty and the place of the self and the nature of community and and all these things right so i haven't really kind of worked it out but I'm, I'm uncomfortable with this world in and with this subject position in a way that i wasn't before i still think the language is gorgeous but i'm a little i'm increasingly anxious about where we find ourselves if we get seduced by the language of the poem in this way, it's a little bit like, you know, because Kvetching when we were reading Milton's Paradise Lost, like, I think Milton's an incredibly beautiful poet, but like, oy, <laughs> you know, there's like some problematic things. I I feel like I've kind of always had that view of Dante once I actually started reading him. Mostly I'm just bowled away by his arrogance, <laughs> um, but I also don't trust a lot of his politics, and I, I suppose I'm not as interested in what he's trying to sell religiously as he would like. Um, but yeah, there's, there's still lots of stuff that I, I like about the text. I, I mean, again, it's languages can be really amazing. Some of the imagery is just fantastic. The formal structure of it all is, is wild. Yeah. It's brilliant structure. <laughs> yeah. And I'm always glad to get to know it a little bit better, even while the whole time I'm reading it, I'm like, Dante, you bleepy 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 bleep. bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> 
So I don't know. I don't know what to do with that entirely. I don't know. I sort of don't know how I feel about the Divine Comedy overall. It's a little bit like Kubrick's 2001. You know, like some people really like it and some people find it a little self-indulgent, but there are these moments, like I'm thinking about that, that sort of vision of the, of the, of the heavens, you know, the, the, I don't know what they call it at the end of, I don't know if you know the movie, but the, the, the this, star baby at the end, yeah, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. the star baby and like that movement through like this intense movement through the cosmos. I mean, Dante feels like that to me in the last canto. It's like, there's this great image in, in the last canto where he's talking about the heavens as a book. In its depth I saw ingathered, bound by love in one single volume, that which is dispersed and leaves throughout the universe, substances and accidents and their relations, as though fused together in such a way that what I tell is but a simple light. The universal form of this knot I believe that I saw, because in telling this I feel my joy increase. Mm. It's like so weird, right? But it's also incredibly beautiful in a way that's like kind of tipping over the edge of what is possible to say or to know. And I still find that very seductive. As as somebody who generally likes the film 2001, you know, I'm I'm just glad it doesn't include long lectures on, I don't know, <laughs> Marxism or whatever it would be. Like, I mean, we do get a lot about instant dinners in space. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know? I will say that the Paradiso is a tough read. It is very putting like there are some there are some very nice moments along the way. Mm. But the last few contas are pretty great. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I found myself, as I was reading it, even when I was in the last few contests, even as things were getting more interesting to me, Hmm. like constantly getting more excited about what was coming yet to come. Even when I read the next to last canto, I was like, okay, and now this one's going to be the really good one. And it was, but it, like this kept going throughout the entire thing, even even within that final canto. I think also one of the things I was thinking about was how he's he's been grappling with how to describe Paradiso, and he's been grappling with how to think about eternity and timelessness in this poem that is obsessed with specifics of time, with like his lived experience of time. And you know, we know from things that happened much earlier in the Divine Comedy what happens next, right? That he, you know he will get back down to earth and he will write this poem and so forth. So that can't be the ending, and the ending is him staring at the face of God and thinking about that. And then, um, what are those very last lines? As the geometer who tries so hard to square the circle but cannot discover, think as he may, the principle involved, so did I strive with this new mystery. I yearn to know how. Could our image fit into that circle? How could it conform? But my own wings could not take me so high. So again, failure. But then a great flash of understanding struck my mind, and suddenly its wish was granted. At this point, power failed high fantasy. But like a wheel in perfect balance turning, I felt my will and my desire impelled by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. End. And it's like... That moment in which he feels like he can achieve understanding and describing and writing down this vision of paradise and eternity that he's had is when the poem ends. Because it's only after the poem has ended that you experience the entirety of the poem outside of time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because it's all your memory of what you've just read and everything that you thought along the way. It's formed this, you know, platonic ideal or something. It's formed, it's formed the memory of it in your head. And it no longer is bound by the 11 syllables per line and the three lines per tercet and the, you know, have 33 or 34 cantos per section and the, and the whole hundred cantos of the whole thing. No, it's just become this thing, this, this unit outside of time. And it's a great trick. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It is. It's like visionary experience, right? It's the thing you see and, you know, you you perceive as if you saw it all at once, right? Or like in a dream, if you wake up and you like know something and then you're in real time and all of a sudden it slips right out of your fingers like sand or something, right? I mean, that's what he's talking about when he comes down to earth again and he's back in the cycles of time, right? The the time that moves the sun and the other stars, right? He's back in linear time after being outside just for a second, right? And that's super trippy. Gotta give him props for that. Gotta give him credit sometimes. 100%. (laughs) We asked you, listeners, to suggest to us some other books that might have been in our time cluster, and we got 
Lots and lots of suggestions. It was amazing. Yeah. A lot of them were science fiction related, but not all of them. And uh, it would be interesting to think about how they might have joined up with these. Uh, we're not going to be able to read all of them, of course, but Suzanne, is there one that particularly jumps out to you? Well, there's a couple that, that stood out to me um, because I've always been fascinated by time travel, like the problems that arise from traveling in time. So one of the ones that got mentioned here was Robert Heinlein's The Door into Summer, a novella. Uh, with, with all that entails, Sean says, um, uh, called The Door into Summer, which has one of the more interesting time travel approaches I've come across. You can go backward because the past is set, but not forward as the future is indeterminate. And um, I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, that is interesting. And I guess it disagrees with a lot of uh, other time travel books in which, there were, at least I know that there are some, because literally just talked about that on my other podcast, which we recorded a few hours ago. We were talking <laughs> about time travel narratives and crossover. Yeah. And, uh, and, and many of them, you can only go forward. And in fact, like there are scientific arguments that if time travel were a thing, it would only be able to go forward. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting, uh, tweak on that. Uh, we got a recommendation for Borges' Labyrinths, of course. That has already come up a little bit, although I guess we didn't really talk about it. But but uh, some of the stories, some of the Borges stories were very important to Zewald. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've never done Borges um, in a standalone way, but we've brought him in as a point of comparison a few times. We've nearly done him once or twice. He, yeah. He's been on the list. He's been on the short list and on the schedule, and then things change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, of course, he's, he's, he's fabulous and has all sorts of interesting stories that make you think about time in, in new ways. Another one that I hadn't thought of, but is it makes a lot of sense, is um, Sarah had mentioned um, Shakespeare's Winter's Tale with its big time jump in the middle so Shakespeare can work through the idea that there might still be time in middle age to repair the terrible things you did when you were young. So this idea of time kind of being in two parts, um, I, I found that also really intriguing. Yeah. Um, a few people recommended Audrey Niffenegger's The Time Traveler's Wife. Mm. Uh, Leah said it's an interesting take on time travel and how it might affect relationships. Mary-Kate also recommended Amal El Motar and Max Gladstone's This Is How You Lose the Time War, which is also about uh, a, a romantic relationship that occurs between two time travelers and how they can communicate to each other. And uh, they're on different sides of a, of a war and how that affects their relationship. I haven't read The Time Traveler's Wife. I have read This Is How You Lose the Time War, and I am the only person in the world who did not like that book. <laughs> Everybody else does. People I very much respect love that book, and they're probably right and I'm probably wrong. That book left me so cold, but that's okay. <laughs> I was also enchanted by a suggestion from Mark, uh, The Legend of the Seven Sleepers, which, again, it's like not about time travel as such, but it's about, uh, Mark says, uh, it accounts for cultural change and change in, changes in currency over the years, but doesn't mention language change. Is basically you know, people who are in a cave and time goes by and then they wake up and they come out and the world is different. So, I mean, they don't. There's not. There's no time machine involved, but there is this sense of living in a different time from the one you started out in. And it's really influential. Like it has a, a rich, rich, rich afterlife in many languages. That story. That that sounds very interesting. Um, I don't know it, I don't think. There's a whole bunch of different versions. There's even a short um, summary of it that shows up in the Quran. Oh, interesting. And then once again, someone has recommended a canticle for Leibowitz. This one mm. keeps coming up as something we should talk about. I really do need to get around to reading it. But Jared says uh, that a canticle for Leibowitz is a fantastic book about how abysses of time reset human cultural memory and tumble us into the same mistakes and same beauties over and over which sounds like it would have fit right in. Yeah, a very rich topic we stumbled over. There will be another time cluster, I, I suspect, on our horizon. Or you can just listen to this one again. <laughs> An endless time loop. So that was our cluster on time. It's over. Time's over. And now we're going to be talking about something else entirely. Our next cluster is going to be on the city. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. And we had a funny kind of experience in thinking about what books we would choose. We often try to choose like a range of different kinds of things, like things that are in English, things that are in different languages, things that are more modern, things that are older, different kinds of people who've written them and so on. And it was tricky because we couldn't, I, at least I couldn't come up with any good choices for early texts. 
partly because we'd done a number of the early city books, like the, we did Christine Pizan's book of the City of Ladies, and we had done Boccaccio's Decameron, another city book there. We're, oh, yeah, we're not doing Augustine's City of God. Oh, it's tragically, not, tragically. Doing, is that a favorite of yours? Or? No, I'm teasing. I mean, okay. I mean, I've read it, but like... <laughs> not that not enough to make you read it. Um, or Dante's Inferno right, is also kind of a city book in some way. Yeah. Um, but um, we've done those, right? We have done those. So we're going to look at, I guess, a more 20th century look at the city. Uh, we are going to start with an old friend. Uh, we're going to do another book by Virginia Woolf. Mm, Mrs. Dalloway. I'm actually really excited because I read this for the first time when I was like a teenager and I loved it. And I've read it a couple times since then, but I haven't read it for a while. So it'll be really fun to get back to. Yeah, I think I read it similarly when I was either a teenager or in my early 20s, and I enjoyed it quite a lot, and I haven't read it since. I may have tried to start reading it again, but didn't get too far into it, uh, just because there's uh, so many other things. Uh, I'm excited to look back at it and try it again and, and you know, uh, decide to read the novel myself. And what else are we going to read? After that, we're going to look at a somewhat... Uh, contemporary. We'll do a little compare and contrast uh, a novel uh, because it's time. We're doing your boy James Joyce. We're doing Ulysses. It's about time. Oh, oh <laughs> man. Let's stretch out. Oh, wow. I have to read all of Ulysses by by June. Okay. Maybe we may read a little bit selectively, perhaps. <laughs> It'll be actually super interesting because that's like almost a cliche, right? Talk about Wolf and Joyce as, you know, very different points in the modernist spectrum, right? It actually be really interesting to think about the texture of the language. I, I think that'll actually be neat. I mean, I, I read that also like years ago, but I never, I hadn't read them close in time to one another. So it'd be neat to put them up against one another. I have read a good chunk of Ulysses, but I've never actually read it cover to cover. Hmm. Um, I've read about it quite a lot and I've read sections of it and I've read some sections of it multiple times and I've done all sorts of things like that, but I've never sat down from point A to point B. I've got myself an audiobook version of it. I'm going to make a real project out of it. It'll be fun. It should be fun. I hope so. And, uh, what is the third book we're going to do in that cluster? We're going to read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, which I'm really looking forward to again. It's something I read years ago. And and was very moved by it, but I haven't read it recently, so I'm looking forward to going back to it. This one is sadly a book that I haven't read yet. Uh, I'm glad to finally get a chance to to change that and fix that. Yeah, yeah, no, it'll be. I think they'll 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 be doing very different kinds of things, and the texture of the cityscape that they're each talking about, like different cities, different ways of connecting to the city, different ways of representing the city in language. I think that's going to be super interesting. Yeah. All right. Well. Uh, we will start that in our next episode. But until then, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 55. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at The Spouter Inn.